Hello, everyone. My guest today is Peter Dabal. He has more than 25 years of experience in the science and business of advertising effectiveness. He spent his career developing and implementing analytical models and testing systems to measure consumer response to advertising. As CEO of Ace Metric, he's led the company in developing innovative metrics and methods for helping advertisers make better, more impactful video creative. He was the CEO of Bunchball, Chief of Insights at Yahoo, and President and CEO of Comscore Media Metric. He's received numerous industry awards recognizing his leadership in advertising research, including a 2011 Great Mind Award from the ARF and is a regular contributor to media outlets and advertising industry associations. Peter, are you ready to take us to the top? I'm ready. My I'm gosh, ready. that's a mouthful. You've seen a lot, huh? Yeah, I've been around the block, I'll say, but it's uh, from old school, just basic television all the way through some of the new media um, and some of the new formats out there. It's really been an exciting ride. So tell us about Ace Metrics. Kind of what space are you playing in and how do you make money? What's your business model? Yeah, so we, when I came out of Yahoo and I looked back at the TV world at the time, this is like 2010. It really hadn't changed a lot in over a decade. TV was still bought and sold the same way. Advertising was done the same way. Um, and so we decided to build a technology company around evaluating ads. And the fundamental difference for Ace Metrics was we wanted to say, we want to test every ad in the United States, not just a client ad here or there. And so our philosophy is you only know if an ad's good, if you know how good every ad is good, because we're all being bombarded with ads every day. And so we build a technology solution that basically grabs every ad that airs, tests it, put it in a syndicated database in 24 hours as opposed to the four to six weeks it used to take. This so is on TV. That's on TV. And then about two years after that, there wasn't much video back then <laughs> in 2010. A couple years later, we uh, launched into digital video. So now we cover anything that moves basically from six second ads right on up to a uh, five minute long form. And how are you technically getting this? I mean, is it just a, a more advanced form of scraping essentially to get these video files? Exactly. And there's a lot of third parties out there that actually collect the video ads. And we also get a lot of direct ads from clients if they want us to test them before they air. So that's another key part of our business is, hey, we've got these five versions. Let's test them and see which one works best before we you know, waste all the media money. And what are some of the inputs you are looking at to decide if an ad actually does perform? So there's some standard metrics on attention and likability. Those are kind of ones that measure breakthrough. So are you going to pay attention in the first place? Because now, of course, we don't have to watch, right? We can skip through it. We can, uh, you know, watch it on, on Hulu. We don't need to see the ads. So as you're wearing your, your Disney shirt and Hulu sounds like we'll soon be part of Disney or at least a steak. I know. I know. I, I'm telling you, they're beefing up, aren't they? For yes. the <laughs> for the battle. Um, but uh, so we test attention and likability. We also measure things like information, purchase intent. Do people remember the brand? A lot of time they'll love the ad. They forget the, who the brand is for. Um, but then we've also started to collect uh, verbatim comments. So comments that people actually talk, talk about the ad. And then we mine those for emotion. And that's been the most exciting part of really over the last year or so is really getting at that emotional driver. Are you having to pay these folks to watch these ads to give you the feedback or are you doing it some way organically? No, we, we actually get them to watch it because our view was we want a pure sense of the creative. We don't want to see whether they remember seeing an ad last night or that gets all mixed up with how much media weight is behind it. We really want their initial reaction to that creative. And so we work with a lot of different sample vendors to actually get people to participate. And we have over 500 people per ad, geodemographically balanced to the U.S. Census. And then they turn those nine simple questions into, a, into our database. So you, you have ways to make sure it is a representative cohort. Exactly. exactly. And what's your and, business model? I mean, is it, is it pure play SaaS or what? Yeah, so it's it's well, it's not pure play, but it's pretty close. I mean, we we um, we sell us a subscription, so we basically charge clients a subscription, and they not only see their ads, but they see every ad in their category, which is really important for co competitive benchmarking and and really understanding what your competitors are doing. And then we have more of an on-demand service for people that have creative that they want us to test that hasn't aired yet. So so the test ads that uh, everybody gives us. And just focusing on the SaaS side, give me a general sense of con track size? Are they paying a grand a month, a 10 grand a month, a million a month? 10 grand a month roughly. And, and then they get access to all of the ads, as I said, all the ads in their category. And and it also depends a little bit you know, on how many ads are in the category. If you're talking mobile phones, you're seeing dozens of ads every that are new every week. If you're talking about 
other categories they may have only two or three creatives a year. Interesting. And are they, I mean, so how does this compare to other things on the market? I mean, we mentioned Nielsen a little bit in the, in the, in the intro, do they not already do this? No. So Nielsen and Millward Brown and uh, some of these other copy testing outfits are really pre-automation guys. And so our fundamental difference was on the technology and the normative data and all of the competitive assets. Um, Nielsen measures uh, more on a recall basis. So what you watched, if you watched a show last night, they'll ask you questions about the show and they'll try to ask you questions about what ads you saw. And it's much more about, do I remember seeing it? Um, that's valuable for certain things, but for us, that gets tangled up in where the ad's running, how much media weight's behind it, not necessarily the creative itself. And so we wanted that pure form measure of the creative effect. Okay, that makes interesting sense. Okay, give me some more of the backstory here. When did you launch the company? So we launched in 2010. Uh, the cool thing now is we have campaigns going all the way back there. So, um, you know, we were talking with with E-Trade and, you know, E-Trade wants to know how the baby campaign uh, compared to some of their new work. Well, the baby campaign is now five years old, but we all remember it, right? So um, that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, is really fun when you can able to go back with that much history now. We have like the largest ad database in the world now. Measured by what? Measured by number of ads that have actually been scored. Interesting. Interesting. Um, where was your head at in 2010? I mean, were you already kind of you know, you had an exit, you're wealthy, had plenty in savings. This is just fun for you. Or is this something like, I want to do this. And by the way, I have to make it work. Otherwise I'm broken on the street. <laughs> well, it's kind of a, a weird passion of mine that everybody focused on the measurement of ads. They ignored the creative. <laughs> and so they measured everything else. They measured how much we bought, how many eyeballs we hit, you know, all of those things about delivery, but they didn't measure with what. And we all knew that in our heart of hearts, you know a great ad when you see it. And so that was really the passion that we wanted to go after. And, you know, coming out of spending 10 years in digital, we, we thought we were kind of uniquely qualified to build this for TV at the time, but for video, uh, because no one else was doing it. Everybody else in TV land was doing it kind of the, the old way. Okay, interesting. Now, have you bootstrapped this or have you raised capital? No, we wait, raise capital. We, you know, it's given this was my first merry-go-round. We wanted to make sure we had really quality VCs. And how much total have you raised? Uh, we've made, raised about twenty million. Okay. And what are they kind of when you have conversations with them about valuations and things like that? What are the critical kind of critical kind of business things they're looking at to decide valuation? Yeah. So the key things obviously are growth. You know, they want to see uh, subscriber growth in the SaaS model and recurring revenue growth, which which is good. Um, we're actually, uh, making money now. So, so God, you know, would you think, would you think of that? Say that again. No. <laughs> we can, we're making money. <laughs> so, um, that, that kind of built, as you know, that kind of gives you a lot of freedom, uh, to, to kind of, uh, try new things. If you keep on the plus side of that, um, the other things are, um, uh, you know, really, really just looking at gross margins. And I think the cool thing about a syndicated database and me coming from Comscore, which is the same model, you know, you collect the data once and you sell it many times, the incremental margins are fantastic. And so that's another key, key part of the business that, are, that's good. Are you in the kind of 85, 90% typical SaaS gross margin range, or do you have kind of human touch on your services side of the business that drives that down? Yeah, it drives it down a little, but still over 80. So wow, okay. So we d deliberately invested in a service layer, you know, client service people, because the television market research people are just used to it. And so they didn't want a tool to give them the answer. They wanted the answer. Yeah, that so makes sense. Now, we, what, we had that. We and had what that. have you scaled to today? How many customers are on the platform? We've got 95 to 100 uh, top advertisers on the platform, you know, banging on it every day. Um, Continue to see good growth in, in, you know, all of the core metrics. And uh, as I said, making money so we can really scale it. We don't need a lot of people to do this. It's a highly automated thing. Um, and for a research company or however people want to bucket is technology or research, um, we have we have gross margins that are unheard of. I mean, a lot of the research companies are really high touch, really consultative, very, very low margins. So you kind of stand out there. What's your team size? Team size is only about uh, 45 Okay. including uh, are really probably overweight a little bit on our engineering investments just because we, again, want to stay out in front on the technology side. Yep. Um, 
the technology looks really good. It looks like it's a technology company, not like Nielsen trying to make software, you know? So, so it's, uh, it's been a really good, uh, really great team. Yeah. I mean, and look, if I back into it, if you have 95 customers, you mentioned earlier, maybe an average of about 10 grand a month. I mean, have you broke the million dollar a month mark yet? Uh, we're right up. Well, yeah, we've broken that. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Well, it sounds like that just happened like last month. Well, pretty close, but it's been a nice, it's been a nice, uh, you know, a nice ramp. And I think the thing for, for us is new customer growth, because I think the market finally came caught up to us. Um, when we talk digital, one of the things we talk about is that people are bombarded with creative, but they don't have to watch it, as I said before. So you have this oversupply of video. I mean, some brands have brought their creatives in-house, are producing hundreds of pieces of creative a month, uh, and just kind of puking it out there. Um, and yet consumers are increasingly blocking, skipping, avoiding, doing anything they can to avoid it. So the question is, what's going to win in this battle is going to be fewer and better. And uh, how do you know if it's better I- unless you test it and have a thorough understanding of the overall category to effect? So that, that's really where we fit. And yeah, I mean, what you're betting on is that you can actually predict what you just said. I mean, the reason people are vomiting everywhere is because they don't know what's going to work, but they know if they put out enough, hopefully one of them catches virality in a bottle. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great to have a sense of that before? It would. Yeah, uh, it that's would. Really, that's really what we're uh, we're uh, moving from descriptive kind of behavior to predictive behavior, and and that's really where these emotions come in. Because if you see it, and that's really firing, and and again, we're comparing against eighty thousand ads, so we have a really big database. We actually just published a paper. It's kind of interesting, which was using this emotion on how to win a can lion. And how to win a what? A can lion, oh. which is the big industry creative awards. Yeah. Um, and we did that by analyzing can winners and then comparing it to the rest of the database and say, what do these things have that the others don't that makes them a can winner? So it was a pretty interesting study on being able to un- unravel what it is that makes these things so special. That's at asymmetrics.com. We can look it up. Yep. Awesome. Yes. We'll, we'll certainly look at that. Yeah. You know, back to some of the economics. I mean, you're super healthy with 45 folks and 12 million bucks in AR. I mean, you're, you're a good hundred grand above industry average in terms of revenue per employee in the B2B SaaS space, which is about 137 based off our data set. So, I mean, it, you know, what you're saying rings true. Um, your team, you said is 45. Where are you guys all based? So the biggest team, I mean, you know, in this world, we're kind of all over the place, but the biggest team is in LA. So we have a core ground in El Segundo. Um, we have a fairly big presence in New York and, sh- and a few people in Chicago. And then we're just kind of everywhere, um, wherever the advertisers are. And w- you mentioned earlier, you're growing f- really fast. That's why you're able to raise the capital. What are you growing at right now year over year? You know, we're growing at about around 20, you know, around 20 to 20 to 30. Um, we did feel a bit of a, a slowdown, I think, um, maybe two or three years ago. I think the overall industry spending levels were off. Um, and so we really are, um, you know, we still have to be, and if you see like some of the agency, um, Martin Sorrell, for example, and other agency groups are seeing really sharp cutbacks in, in the traditional agency model. So we kind of have to, we're kind of in that, uh, ocean, you know, where we skip a bit of the ebb and flow. Um, but comparing us to kind of comps in, in the research space, we're way above norm. So Um, we feel like we've got a solid thing, as I said before, when we're making money and we're ba- able to maintain that, I think it's, it bodes well for us going yeah. forward. And yeah, so like if we go back 12 months in December of 2016, today, again, and today you're at over a million a month. So it's fair to say what you're at about 800 grand 12 months ago, a month. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's good growth. Yeah. A lot of these companies kind of, kind of in the media space, they were taking like a percentage of spend or trying to get a, a chunk of attribution, the famous ad tax. And now they're trying to figure out how to go a SaaS model, but they're stuck in the middle and neither yeah. one's working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you've, got, you've got a, the other thing is you've got some consolidation where, where a lot of the big brands are sick of the ad tech stuff. They just want to deal with a, uh, like a Google or a Facebook or, you know, a big vendor and concentrate their spend there. Um, so there's just a lot of flailing around, uh, when you look around and I feel like, um, to be able to have the growth, the the kind of profitability and the stability with these big advertisers, I think, uh, we've, we've kind of weathered a lot of that pretty well. Yeah. Uh, What are you right now paying to acquire customers? You know, it's all over the map, to be honest with you. I think what we found is that, um, you know, some of the traditional marketing avenues weren't that successful for us. 
And so we, we went back and, and like, you're talking Facebook ads, Google ads, things like yeah, that. Yeah, like exactly. Or, you know, advertise ad, ad age and, you know, pr- promotional stuff. And what we really found is uh, well-written personalized outreach on an ad that uh, we've already scored because we score everything. We already know more than the advertiser. That personal outreach directly from me is what's really causing people to read and and pay attention. And so um, going back to small ball and not trying to conquer the world uh, and really go one-on-one with all these advertisers has really been... um, really been successful for yeah, us. You'll, you'll take one of their videos that who, and they're not a client yet and then email them and say, here's some recommendations based on our data set. And they say, we yeah. want you to do it for us. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, here's an ad that broke last night on the voice. Um, we thought you'd be interested to know how this stacked up, yep. you know, and, and are you going to open that email if you're a CMO somewhere? Of course yep. you are. Yep. Now, if you look at kind of your team and the people dedicated to sales and onboarding and all that, I mean, do you try and back into a fully weighted CAC so you can understand lifetime value and some of the other economics? We do. I mean, we we are, are constantly looking at optimizing the best way to kind of go to market. But a lot of times uh, clients are interested in really um, starting with pre-testing. So really understanding ads that they've got. That's a huge pain point. They want to make sure they don't blow it. Uh, give me 10 ads that they're kind of building in a campaign. Let's test them, get started, and then move into the description and kind of, um, you know, higher end add ons yeah. as we go. Well, so let me ask, let me ask this a different way. Um, what do you like to, what do you like to optimize your payback period for, right? How, how quickly do you want to get your money back on, on acquisition? You know, on acquisition, almost one contract covers it, right? For so a year. I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got so, it. So it's really that one annual contract, but I think it's also building a relationship with these marketers. I think that's the thing that a lot of SaaS co- companies miss is that, um, especially when you're dealing with traditional big brand advertisers, they really want a relationship and understand that you're sure. going to help them make better creative, not just give them another tool. And so I think that's that's the that's the sweet spot of every time we get started, even if it's a ten thousand dollar pilot. Um, we know that we're going to be able to convert that going forward. Yep. Yeah. I mean, look at 10 grand a month and your CAC, you know, right now call it 12 month recovery period. That's 120 grand spending them. Maybe that's the worst case scenario to get them. But what's your churn look? What's your churn look like right now? Have you lost any customers? Uh, Well, we have some in kind of the ebb and flow. Like I said, you know, some brands uh, decide they're not going to go on TV. You're talking 5%, 10%, 20% annually? um, We budget around 85% retention. And so we usually beat that, but it's around 90% retention, 10% churn. And I even break that further into controllable and uncontrollable, right? So obviously uh, the uncontrollable is just some of these regime changes or something happens at a client, they pull back all their media spend. Those are things that um, we still keep the relationship alive, but sometimes we'll lose a contract and win them back in a couple of years. Yep, that makes good sense, Peter. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's the last business book that you read? The last business book I read are The Art of the Start, which is uh, my son's in an entrepreneurship school, believe it or not, uh, out in the East Coast. And he told me to read it. So it, it wound up being a pretty good book. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? You know, I am really interested in the Southwest CEO. Um, and we, we've started to do some work with them, but I just think it's... On the transparency ads? Yeah. And it's just it's just the culture they create in that company is just fundamentally unique from anything I've ever seen. And I think the culture side of a CEO's job is, is kind of... Um, downplayed. It's not as important to me. I think that's what really makes a company great. And, and that's, a, that's a good example of it, I think. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? Uh, Cirrus. Cirrus Insights? <laughs> yeah, we, we use Cirrus all the time because we're into this individualized email and we need to track where it goes. And it's, it's funny, you know, sometimes I'll send a note out, even if it's not favorable about a campaign saying, look, you know, you should know this. Uh, we can track, we get, you know, a hundred opens within a company within two days. I mean, <laughs> so that, that ability to track, it sounds pretty simple minded. It's not really that new, but boy, it works. Yeah. Cirrus and you guys are actually about the same size. Brandon Bruce, the CEO just came on a few days ago. Um, yes, yeah. And they passed 150,000 customers doing about a million bucks a month. Uh, really healthy growth yes, there too. too. Yeah. They're yep. doing great. All right. Number, uh, number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? 
I actually sleep pretty well. I, I usually get about seven hours. That's good. And what's your situation? You mentioned you have a kiddo, but married, single, how many kids? Uh, married, three kids, one out of school, and one just graduated, and one still in. That's cool. And how old are you, Peter? I am 57. 57. Last question. Take us back 37 years. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Uh, I wish, um, I wished I'd paid a little bit more to some of the emerging technology, obviously hindsight's a 2020 thing. Um, I was a pilot back then and, and, uh, part-time bartender and, you know, all of doing all the fun stuff, but there were some emerging technologies. And so I really try to keep on that fringe, the fringe of what's next, not, not the mainstream stuff, but really the fringe of some of the emerging technologies and seeing what's going to be the next big thing. He's still a part-time bartender. He just didn't want to admit it. Peter with Ace Metrics launched back in 2010, had some success in the space before this, really understanding inside of other companies, how this space is working, saw an opportunity to do this kind of real time with video, uh, doing it all over the place. They a team of 45 remote now serving 95 clients, helping them make their ads better, specifically their video ads. Ads. They did about 800 grand uh, in terms of monthly recurring revenue 12 months ago in December 2016. Now over a million bucks a month, over a $12 million run rate, retaining over 90% of their customers year over year. Super healthy payback period of 12 months and 20 million bucks raised to continue changing and updating this industry. Peter, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you.